everybody. Welcome back for an all new Incredipole cast. Today we're going to be talking about our new series, The Incredible Pole Farm. And I'm joined by special guests today. We have my beautiful wife, as always, Beth Pole. Hello, everyone. Uh, our amazing executive producers, Emily Hyman and John Collin. I'm so glad to, to have John and Emily with us today because they bring such a unique, unique insight into the filming of The Incredible Pole Farm, having been so uh, involved in every step of the process. Why don't you guys start out by just telling a little bit about who you are and what goes into producing this reality series in particular? Oh, man, there's a lot of ways to attack this question because there a lot went into it. We were lucky enough to film over a year, which is a rare opportunity um, in our in our field, usually, you know, everybody wants things fast and quick. And so your production schedules are really tight, but we were lucky enough to shoot over the span of a year, which was great because it meant that we could follow stories from, you know, all seasons, which I think is really important in farming. Um, and, but it also meant that we, you know, we were constantly, I think for a year we were, talking all the time. So I, we got, we were lucky enough to be ingratiated into the pole family. Uh, am I, can I say that? Am I, do I have? Yes, my, absolutely. absolutely. I would agree with that. Actually, you know, Emily, you were our rock. I have to say just from, from like my point of view, but I think that uh, Beth would agree with me. There was challenges, uh, many challenges with doing this show uh, many weather related challenges, some early mornings, some late nights, and honestly, some unexpected uh, last minute rushes. You were always there. <laughs> if it was cold and rainy, you were out there. If it was hot and and humid, you were out there. And that really kept kept us going. I and mean, you you're, know, you know you're how like, Charles loves his rocks. You're grinding. So that's a big statement. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It was getting closest outside in all weather. <laughs> you know, I uh having, you know, talked about Emily and and her being a grinder and her part of this like John, you were really a part of this before there was even a series and you kind of worked from conception to like execution of of the final cuts. Um how in your mind how did the show kind of evolve did you see it was it the way that you initially envisioned it or did you find the show as we shot it i, I think when, when we first were brought in on the show i think that you know uh you had fully developed out the basic concept of you were starting a farm it was a spin-off of the veterinary show um so we were um you know, I, I had never sort of heard of a farm show before, but the, the big thing that I think helped get this across, you know, to a green light with the network was the success of Clarkson's Farm. And Clarkson's Farm is, you know, it's essentially a comedy. And so that was sort of my entry point into, into this show is like, we're going to make a comedy. I didn't know, I, I, I was not a, um, I wasn't a huge, uh, fan of the the vet show, not for that. I just had never seen it before, so I didn't really know before we started working together, um, sort of what the potential was. But I knew that that it was that sort of almost like fish out of water story from the Clarkson's farm that I think that I had heard from the network that they were interested in. And you know, I think we went away from that because, like, at the end of the day, like we when we went into production, it was just like you need <laughs> you Charles, Ben, and Beth need and doc need to create a farm and so that's we were like that is such a huge undertaking uh, that i kind of had forgot about the comedy because we were just like we just need to like get 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 the foundation built get the animals in build these huge structures and then you know as we started shooting um and you guys were as wonderful as you were on camera and behind camera i think the comedy sort of came back around so 
and uh, and then and then I think we, you know, from the producing side, we had just a ton of fun like leaning in on that and being like, how how do we sort of push that? I don't know if it's a fish out of water story because you're, you know, this is your land, this is you, you are so familiar with it, but it's that sort of it, it was that idea that we were drafting off of from you know from the Clarkson's farm that you know proved that like people will watch farming, you know, and and that it's it can be entertaining. So. Um, I don't know. I, I hope that answers your <laughs> your question. I no, think. it's. I think it's a great answer. I actually, you know, I think I go back to a, a conversation we had early on, and and you kind of asked how I saw my role in in the show in the context of of like you know other entertainment media, so to speak. And my head went right to Clark Griswold. I see myself kind of as a as a Clark Griswold with like the best intentions and yet the outcomes that can be less uh, than desirable in certain circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think I can see a lot of that in there. I don't know if you actually pulled the uh, that as inspiration or if I'm just nailed myself down to a <laughs> A fictional character, but I definitely saw a lot of Clark Griswold in there. I'm going to seriously th rethink any vacations in Europe with you. That's all I can say. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I uh, Clark Griswold is like burned into my brain from like a very early age. Like I was the perfect age to you know for that sort of seep in. But yes, I think you nailed yourself on that, Charles. <laughs> So I mean, like the so we're we're breaking down here today. We're talking about episodes five and six, which um, were basically uh, what's interesting is so many reality shows, including the Incredible Doctor Poll, they pull footage from various time points. But our our uh, episodes are very sequential and when they happen and, and when they aired. And so it was, those were almost a, a week. Those two episodes almost were just like one week. We're building the sheep hut. We got these animals, we got the fair going on and it's all going on at one time. Was that like a blessing or a curse to you guys uh, that you had this like, period of time and you had to get it right there there were no makeups there were no like pulling from other other sections of time why don't you talk about the curse part and i'll talk about the blessing part <laughs> <laughs> you know i think we shot something like nine days straight or something like that um it was it was you know there's there's like the the personal aspect where you're like you're just you're you're going and they you know because we couldn't stop and that's like you know to get your it's like the comedy but it's all was a gift in this series but also their natural stakes you know those we couldn't shift the timeline of the fair we couldn't shift the timeline of when animals were going to arrive so you know we we had to this was this was our window to tell that story which was so important um which is a TV gift um, that you don't have to, you know, make up a, any sort of drama. It's it's naturally baked in. Um, so that 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 part was that, that was that was effort. But um, there's something also wonderfully honest and rewarding and authentic. And I think I think I can speak for John. Like the our favorite part of our jobs because you're get to live in this moment with you all. We're not poking and prodding for, you know, any sort of like faux reality. This is really what we're, what we're living with and, um, you know, making our way through it together. So. Was it hard to have to pick and choose? Sometimes there's only enough crew and there are so many things happening and to decide which elements were going to be the most important for capturing. That is always yeah. a dance. Yes. <laughs> there were so many things to that. I, I think that's a really interesting thing to say about I, I we if I had to go over again now with the knowledge that I have there, you know, from like going back and looking at those episodes, I think I wish there were certain things that we could have sort of expanded upon, but like 
I think just to what Emily's point was there, like you guys were stressed and, you know, I'll add ben, ben, ben may have been the most stressed. I don't know. Um, that like that reads on camera, you can see that. And I think, um, you know, I, was, I said this before we started a recording, but like I was listening back to that interview you did with Ted Duvall, who is the showrunner of um, the vet show. And what you guys talked about in that interview is how, um, what Ted talked about was just how authentic the, the the show, and I think that he attributed that to the success of of the vet show. And here, like <clears throat> that, that was I think am among everything that we filmed that week or those two those episodes were probably not that there was ever any anything inauthentic, but like you guys were the stress that's that's there on camera was like was was there uh very much in in the filming and and we felt that and like we were you know as, as producers um we often get in the way of of people you know of you guys trying to accomplish what you need to do because we need to get the sound bites we need to like make sure that we're telling a very clear story and so the stress of that on the on the production is like you you it was really down to the wire to get that sheep hut built before you know all of the animals came there was a, just a ton to do and so <clears throat> it's like how do we how do we get what we need to do to tell our story while we allow you guys to like accomplish what you need you really need to do so um that was um i mean besides just the long hours i think it, yeah it was nine days without a break which is pretty atypical for television production um it was a stressful that was that that was i think that my stress of just trying to like make sure that we told a clear really compelling story um while you guys still could like you know get to the finish line on, on everything you had to build yeah and we had down too much yeah <laughs> Yeah, and we had some really great wins through that period, too. We did get the sheep hut done. The fair was such a fantastic event that we were able to attend. And so despite all of the stresses and the craziness, we all pulled together and were able to be ready for the animals to arrive. We had the elements in place that we needed to. We um, were able to do the things at the fair that we wanted in terms of the auction, despite the prices and some of the craziness that was occurring. So it really, it really was fantastic um, as a journey for us to go through. It was very, very busy and, as you noted, stressful, but so rewarding at the same time. It was that sense of accomplishment and having finished what we we set out to start um, in preparation for the animal's arrival. Well, I think that one of the the things that you go in knowing, having my background, know being a producer of television and and rather a connoisseur of it as well um it's so it, it's so i can give you guys the best compliment that i can in saying that it would have been very easy to fabricate elements of this show because of the nature of it and yet you guys were able to accomplish something really difficult and unique in the world of reality television and it was very much reality very authentic as you said john and you know i wonder is there was there a sense of kind of i think of wanting to be more of a documentarian or an art like you know and and doing cinema verite for this versus other projects that maybe you've worked on in the past well let me go back to the beginning <laughs> we'll go back to the very beginning so typically like production companies, so I'm, I'm, I'm a partner in Nomadic Films, we develop shows, we take it to networks, the network likes it or dislikes it, and if they like it, they green light it, right? This was a different process, like you you did most of the early and uh, all, you did all, all the sort of conception and you created sort of the, 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 the foundation for this show. And then Nat Geo brought us in and so like our, uh, brand, our experience is in, as you said, sort of cinema verite. Like we, the, <clears throat> soft scripting shows, it, it, soft scripted reality shows are a thing out there in the, in the world. And, you know, we, we can do that, but our, you know, I think that our reputation is, is built on, you know, shows that are, that are verite and taking actual, you know, characters and, you know, just elevating them and, and, and putting it together. 
And so I don't know why um, why we were brought in on this show. I'm extraordinarily like grateful for Nat Geo Wild for, for for the opportunity to work with you guys and to get brought in. But you know that I assume that they wanted a company and and people who had that experience was was in that in that style um, in the style that you know again like that the vet show sort of like thrives on so much is just, you know, being able to capture incredible reality, incredible characters, and then putting it together in a compelling way. So yeah, it, it never even crossed my mind to, um, you know, to, to try and like up the stakes or whatever, you know, like try and futz with reality, turn you into something that you weren't like that. That was never a conversation. It was never, you know, that was never part of the deal. So yeah. It's hard to improve on Clark Gris Griswold. If you have Clark Griswold, why? <laughs> yeah. What else do you need? Yeah, I was going to say, like, I think there's like, there's, you know, different shows lend themselves to different formats and different, you know, you pull different levers to tell the best story. And in this environment with you guys, with you, you all, and with the stakes of farming and, the comedy of sort of <laughs> your relationships and dynamics. I think oftentimes we were, you know, our job was really to sit back and say like, we just have to let this play and see how this evolves. And the challenge comes or the, you know, our work comes in when we're like, okay, do, is this clear enough? Do we need to like poke and slow you all down to make sure that, you know, we're asking you the question in the moment to make, you know, so if if you are a viewer who's dropping in, you'll understand what's going on. Um, Cause obviously a lot goes unsaid when you're trying to get to a finish line, but we have to say it, you know, because <laughs> it's, <laughs> this, that's the medium. Um, so just as John was saying before, you know, do, do, are we telling the clearest story? Otherwise we can let you guys, you know, build. <laughs> which is what we did we built we built yeah, exactly. and when it, were you guys uh you know this sheep hut i i conceptualized it and i have to say like it, it's pretty much what i conceptualized ben did a really good job i have to give him full credit for taking my crazy ideas as he likes to say and actually executing it to um how i envisioned them like pretty closely like pretty much on the, on the money itself. but Speaking were you guys your wife, i can tell you this very honestly it's a talent to take his vision and make it happen yeah it's sometimes <laughs> it is were, were you guys uh were you guys surprised about the way it turned out or is this how you also envisioned it just out of curiosity because you knew what we were aiming to do but i just wondered if if the end result like exceeded or kind of like met your expectations I think uh, the I like yeah I mean I think we were both when we talk about slowing you down and asking questions I think we kept being like wait what wait no explain it to me again like what is the I mean uh, I I had no idea I mean I had an idea but I had no idea Emily? yeah no I, it, it seemed beyond um, yeah I to be honest I didn't exactly know what what the plan was i knew that there was a lot of like concrete or a lot of uh what the, the um, blocks. concrete blocks that were being yeah. brought in yeah. i saw there was a lot of dirt coming in um yeah but I, I don't know i've never done like a show like this with that like a really large build like that and so um yeah i, I it was it was incredible yeah, things just kept arriving, like, <laughs> and the dirt, and then we picked up, you know, the pole. It was like, yeah, the kids were like, "Oh, look, mom, somebody else is here. Dogs barking, mom. Hello, someone else is here. Do you need to go outside?" It was pretty funny to watch them develop their sense of like, "Oh, this is just this is just how things are. Just trucks keep rolling in, and there's Uncle Ben in the excavator again, and you know." But it's been let, let me ask you guys because it's been a, a year and a half now it's been it's been a long time since you've had it like how is it like we haven't been out there for a long time oh like, yeah well this is getting happening? ahead of ourselves but uh <laughs> that it yeah. actually is <laughs> Season um, two info, but... yeah yeah no but this is it's actually the final fix fixed there hasn't been any issues <laughs> since 
Uh, there was some uh, power issues that we had to clean up uh, with some of the power stuff, and now we got that cleaned up. I'm really hopeful. And then we had to figure out kind of we're doing something a little bit different. We have the sheep and cows separate for the winter. So the emus and the cows are running together. They like I let the emus out of their pen and close them in to <laughs> eat. Yeah, right? they they run back and forth. They run like twenty seven miles an hour. Like they their car cars. drives down the road. They'll run <laughs> alongside the car and then turn around and wait for another car going the opposite direction to run back. They just, I mean, they're very happy. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. That is amazing. That's amazing. And when you guys started this, and Emily said something earlier that stuck with me. She said the phrase, the stakes of farming. And when you first started looking at this project and you're looking at the concept as building a farm and farming, what went through your mind? Because when you put the phrase, the stakes of farming together, I think my first inclination, having never lived in the farming world, would be like, oh, yeah, a lot of stakes. Like you've got weather and planting and then you wait and it doesn't seem as though it would be a drama ridden area and yet it in hindsight it feels quite different to me and I'm curious as to what your perspective was on that I mean and very applicable to episode six which we are <laughs> chatting about um because I think that you know there's the there's the growing aspect and I know that and 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 obviously you, you guys are are doing this for your kids and which is an incredible wonderful um important thing to do but the moment that livestock is introduced as well um there are natural stakes you know the animals arrived you got animals in episode five and six and they arrived and then you had animals to care for um you have bees to care for so there's naturally, you know, along with other goals of the sort of grander goals of the farm, which are incredibly important, you know, having livestock is, is a big responsibility. And, and that in and of itself is, is, it does have stakes because you're now responsible for three cows and four sheep and two hives and, three dogs or two dogs you know it, it's uh it's it's work um and so and you and then you contend with weather and then you contend with you know whatever it is um things breaking down things going uh, you know unplanned etc and so yeah i mean i think that was one of the 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 joys of producing was that I mean, we couldn't have told, there are things that as producers we plan for, or you think you plan for, and you could just throw plans out the window here, you know, nothing, things would sort of go as planned and then it would just take a left turn, right turn, you'd take a U-turn, you'd, you know, sideways, upside down. And, and that was like, that was such a fun part for us. Um, made, made for a lot of footage to edit. And, <laughs> Yeah, sure. but you know that's 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 also the post producers love that, right? Yeah, <laughs> there's probably a good gag reel in there or two as well. Yeah, yeah oh, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I have to say, like, uh, for me, the thing I talked to Beth. Uh, about the known unknowns you know going into this I knew that there were going to be unknowns so they're kind of known the unknowns but there were unknown unknowns that happened where there were things that came out of left field and for me one of the things that were the biggest that came out of left field were the prices at the auction I thought that going into the auction I knew that there'd be s some difficulty because of the number of sheep that usually were there and that, you know, it may be kind of more than my price range. But I thought I knew that if I stayed around that $17 mark, I'd be able to to take on those sheep. And the truth was, is that I couldn't be more off. I mean, it was, some of them were double what I had paid. And I think I only stayed on budget for one one of the sheep total and the rest of them I blew over 
were were you guys like actually panicked? Because I was kind of panicked. I was like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Like, I'm gonna at least get some, but like, I was kind of panicked about it. Were you were you guys panicked? <laughs> like, what happens if we have no sheep? Or uh, we had. I still don't know understand what the heck was happening at that auction. <laughs> no, my, my reaction to the auction was confusion. It was it wasn't stress. By season anything. five, John, it's about how long it's taken me five years visiting the auction. You'll get there. Yeah. yeah. Like I the, the so we struggled and I'll just go into the post production of this a little bit is like it would have been a much clearer story if it was like that cow is like thousand dollars no now it's eleven or eleven hundred dollars twelve hundred but the price per pound it's like well how big is the cow is it a fat cow is it a skinny <laughs> cow like what does that actually mean <laughs> so like it was a struggle that, and i i still like sort of understand like you know and, and we really sort of pinned it to you know like your what your goal was and your budget was at 17 dollars and and that but we I, I don't think and i put this on emily i think Correct me if I'm wrong, but like we didn't understand the whole price per pound thing. Maybe I was like I, out to lunch that day. Did you understand the price per pound? I okay. well, <laughs> I was. I it was all happening too fast, and I, I was I was like something is wrong because I was looking at the monitor, looking at Charles's face and him being stressed, and so yeah. I was like something is stressful. But then I like that it, though. That's like when Charles was stressed, I was like. This is perfect. That's what the producer <laughs> comes out here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was not. But then, you know, then there are moments, it all just happens so quick. And there's a moment where Beth, like, is like, I want this cow. And all of a sudden, you guys are standing up. And I'm like, wait a minute. Did, was that, did we miss a purchase here? I mean, that was. You got it. You got it. You we covered it. it. But it was my <laughs> barely our <laughs> teeth. That was so we had a whole sort of production plan wrapped around making sure that we had, you know, a camera on two cameras on you guys, a camera up on each cow that came through. And like it didn't seem anything was going on. And I think one or even two of our camera people like were on other things when it happened. Like we had to fish out the audio from like, I want that cow. And then we like luckily had you guys standing up to get the get the brown cow it was like that we <laughs> you, we you did a great job it, it, it was seamless pretty, it was pretty it was pretty uh that was pretty crazy i mean once we got past the sheep and i got out i like the stress kind of went away from me and then it was just about kind of having fun and so i we had a jersey cow when i was a kid so i have an affinity for jersey cow so my dad was kind of like, oh, there's a jersey. You should get that one. And I was like, I was already kind of like, maybe I should. But I know they don't necessarily make, like, the best gainers as far as, like, you know, for meat. But then when Bess said, I really like that cow, that was sold. I was already halfway on board. And so the minute she said, like, I really like that cow, I'm like, okay, all right. If anything's going to seal this deal, like, you've – Cause I thought I would have to turn to her and try to sell her on it and be like, Hey, you know, this, uh, Jersey cow it's, but it turned out of all the cows and I, I liked all our cows, but Boots really was the cow that had the personality. I mean, he was so devious in a, a very nice way, but he was always the troublemaker. He became like the other cows are so much bigger than him. And yet he was the boss. Like he just, and you could tell he was smarter he was nicer and i ended up getting to know the girl who who raised the cow and uh and and i i couldn't have picked a better person to support honestly she is fantastic and so it, it really worked out it was kind of like fate and then you know t-bone was kind of like he was the cow that i expected but again like turned out to be a sweet sweet cow the real surprise to me was Ben when he when all of a sudden he was like, hey, you think uh, you would take care of a cow if I bought one? 
And I was like, oh, <laughs> heck, yeah. Like, I was going to get it. I would be like, yeah, I'll split it with you if you just call it yours. Because it was so fantastic of a story. And uh, I think my favorite part was the look on Chrissy's face yeah, Chrissy's when I told face. her that she had bought a cow. To me, that was a, that was a moment that I will remember the rest of my life. Because it's a great thing to be able to tell your sister-in-law that, you know, your husband just bought a cow. <laughs> yeah. Were you guys, did you guys have any inkling? that this was coming or was this right the same way as the jersey just right out of out of you know your wish list i would love to go back and ask ben like if he actually no we had no idea you did not sorry i should still stop, no. stop saying no, that's right. <laughs> Emily, no. You didn't have an idea, right? <laughs> no yeah i don't think we had any idea either he had not talked to us about it before it's like he got caught up in the auction moment and he's like how can i solve this problem hey charles well, I think as well, what I would say is that was the end or the, close to the end of a really long week and um, or two weeks. And I think, you know, it was a, we included these bites in the show, like Ben talks about, you know, he was expecting to be sort of the builder, the guy who puts together the structures for the farm. But the amount of work and effort and just energy that he put into it, um, I I looked at that moment and not the TV show aside, I, but we captured it. Like, I think that he was really starting to feel a sense of sort of ownership or, you know, connection to the farm. And so I think, I, I don't know. I, I look at that moment as a really lovely thing where, you know, he was, he felt a connection to the farm and um, that was his sort of, uh, that was just another way of him participating and, and what um, what you three were were building? Yeah, and as a sister, that made me really happy because I think you hit the nail on the head, John. I think that the connection started out as a an ask, like, do you think you could help us with these uh, structural things that we need to create? And I think that the connection with what we were actually trying to accomplish and the vision and the goal and the dream um, really started to change for him from this idea of I'm here to do this work to like I'm a part of this and I think the cow was a really great example of how he demonstrated that through his actions beyond everything else that he's done like that was a really tangible part of him wanting to hang on to that farm and enjoy that farm even if you know it from his freezer at home you know a year down the road the one thing I would be remiss I I feel like we talked about where we stressed um, the one thing I should mention is that the vet show crew was there as well. And, you know, we are definitely fish out of water in this environment. The entire vet crew that was there covering the event was so calm, cool, and connected. So anytime that we were like, you know, is this right? I'd look around and they'd all just be like, this is. This is, we know these roles. Like, yeah, th it's not their first rodeo. <laughs> there wasn't Quite their first literally. rodeo. They were like, really helpful. You guys should stand here. This is a good place to set up. This is like, they were so patient with us and so thoughtful. And, you know, they were like, oh, you know, they would let us go if, if you know, this was an animal we were following or a story we were following. It was like, so, yeah, that was, that was, they were really helpful yeah. for us. They're a great team. I think we feel very blessed across the board for both shows to have such incredible people to work with, such talent, such consummate professionals who have become, in many cases, friends. We've seen them grow, and Jan and Diane and Charles can certainly speak to that a lot more. They've watched individuals come life happens they're married they have children and like now Jan and Diane see those kids as just an extension of of their family um larger than and Charles I think feels a real sense of closeness with so many people that he spent so much time with and it's a really really great um it's a really great family that we've built here I'm glad that there was such like that the the crews could work together I think that teamwork between the crews and the way that you guys worked with the the vet show because we filmed a lot concurrently but it was very seamless worked out great greater than any expectations i will just going back i will know for me you know and again i go back to a previous podcast beth asked me were there any moments where 
Like I thought this wasn't going to work. And the, tr the truth was like the auction was kind of, I, I just, I stuck with the planting. Um, you know, the planting was the moment where I really had doubt whether we were actually going to fail miserably and not be able to pull this thing off. But the, the auction, I, I was kind of one of my lows, like when we were doing the sheep, but when we got through that and then got the cows and Ben got his cows and we, we were there and we were filming that end, I really did feel kind of like the three amigos or the three musketeers, you know, it was just this real high that I was riding. And that was such a great thing to propel us into the rest of the week the and, and the cows coming home on, on uh, Sunday, I think it was. Um, we had until then to finish uh, the sheep up, but we, we came out riding. I think Ben too came out with so much more energy to like run. Okay. Now we're going to run the water lines, which, you know, we didn't even cover the issues with the water lines. I mean, there was that whole issue where all of a sudden there was like water shooting out of the ground. Like, uh, uh, my and garden we, is we flooding. Just, There's we a just kind of had to, and we had to redig it up and that we didn't cover that. And, um, we had to build the emu pen. There was a lot of stuff that we had to do, but I think, um, that those last days though, checking on the bees, like Beth, was that like when you, when we went to go check on those bees, like, were you stressed out that we were going to lose those hives? I mean, where, what were, where was your head at? Yeah. I mean, I was definitely concerned. I, this was all a very new experience for me. And so it's like every time any little thing was happening that was outside of what I understood to be correct, my stress level would just get really high. I didn't want to lose either one of the hives. Um, I wanted to set them up for success. They're just such a different animal than livestock and other other creatures that you're m more readily able to understand and care for. Like, you know, kids are theoretically easy. They're little people. And animals, well, you can see. Your eyes tell you things. And we're used to livestock in a way because we're kind of used to cats and dogs. And so, okay, like, there's a wound or they're hungry. Like, they made sense. Bees they're really self-sufficient. And so this idea of, okay, well, I have to feed them before winter. Like, how did they survive for thousands of years before people fed them at winter? And so it's, there was like, there was a big learning curve for me in all of that. And so when I hit those points where I became concerned for their safety and well-being, that was when my stress level just went whoop. <laughs> And I, um, I read a lot. I spent a lot of time reading and trying to research. And obviously, we were able to find some resources to help, which was fantastic. Um, but it was there was a lot of highs and lows and ups and downs for me on that. With, with John and Emily, you guys watch Beth's evolution of the bees. Like, what what are your thoughts? I mean, I have my own thoughts that like I was just really blown away by how the transformation that I saw over the course of the series, but I'm just, you guys were quite frankly more involved even than I was in watching that because a lot of times she was out there by herself. So, I mean, what, what were your thoughts on that overall? I, I'm going to let Emily talk. I, I just want for the peak, for the listeners at home who are not watching this on YouTube, Emily has been sitting with her hands in a steeple, just begging <laughs> to talk. <laughs> I am. So. Well, I, it's hard to address at this juncture if we are in episode six without any spoilers. So, but so a potential spoiler alert watching Beth just take ownership with those bees and like she said read and get smart and 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 study i mean that was such a i feel like it was it was such a gift to be able to watch and and watch somebody truly learn and take something on and you know we are so that's i mean that's like such a treat in our job um to, to be able to witness that. I mean, I, she just, she was like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. These are my hives. I'm going to get smart. And that is what she did. And it's empowering. I do think it was in this, in this two weeks where it started to become clear 
but the bees were not healthy. And I think that this, this was the sort of moment and correct me if I'm wrong, Beth, but where you recognize that and then like shift it into high gear and start. And I, maybe you were, I think you were reading before this, but I think, I think that this was sort of a, a, a turning point in your experience with the bees when it was like, Oh, this is not going in a good direction and something needs to change. Yeah. Um, it's, it was that sixth sense of like, I, I something just doesn't seem right. It doesn't feel right. Like it's not jiving with what I understand to be the case. And so, um, yeah, high gear, I think is the appropriate way to describe it. High gear, high stress. Let's go fast yeah. and see if we can get ahead of this. It was stressful. Like, obviously, like we want as producers, we want us a happy happy ending for all, for all of the projects. And I think, you know, certainly with, you know, Ben's expertise that always gave us that sort of, that, (laughs) that, that sense of confidence that things were going to get done. Maybe it was going to be a day late, if anything, or, you know, it's like, and Charles, I obviously know that you know how to take care of, you know, the livestock that you had, but with the bees, that was probably like the most sort of, it just felt more chaotic. It was like, how do you help these little guys you know, winter's coming, like, how do you help them? Um, So that was like, probably the biggest like question mark, I think that we had as producers is like, how do we get this? How do, (laughs) can we help or, you know, and we, I think there was a a greater sense of helplessness where, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a matter of just like feeding them more like there was, and obviously in later in the season, uh, we get into some of the sort of things that you could do to help. Um, but that was a very helpless uh, feeling that we had as producers, I think, because um, we really wanted them to survive the winter time, and like there was just no, uh, there was just no control, like, and so yeah. Uh, they're definitely they're definitely animals that are more complicated, I think, than than your general livestock. Even experts who've been dealing with hives for years and years, their whole lives, have challenges with bees and and maintaining hives. I think that one of the things that sh- like really surprised me because when we were going into this, I thought we talked about Beth this being kind of Beth saying, but I thought after she picked up those bees in the first day, I was like, okay, well, it's gonna be Beth and my thing because I'm gonna have to be out here helping her, and then she she went from just being kind of terrified of them to like being so comfortable it was just incredible to watch the transformation i think that this was the thing that kicked it off though was that i mean you see her go out there for that first time and be like hi bees are you guys okay like just checking on you and then and then it just it keeps on going and spiraling till like you know i won't get like you said no spoilers but there was definitely a transformation talk about a character arc that you could only dream for in a movie. Yeah, we have tea this. parties out there now, Charles. Yeah. I, I take out my cookies and the bees dip them in honey and we just <laughs> hang out. Can I ask, was, were you expecting this? Like, what was that? Was it fun for you to, to I don't know, get, dip your toe in the, I can't think of a cool pun, but you know what I'm <laughs> Into the honey? <laughs> Into the honey. <laughs> um, that's actually a really good question. Uh, when Charles asked me to help with the bees, pick them up, I knew there were timelines. I knew he was stressed to, to get the hay in, and there were other elements that he needed help with associated with the bees. What I didn't realize is that um, it's like the, if you give a mouse a cookie, right? Like he wants the whole thing. And so he watched me have these little nibbles and help. And I don't know if he was like, hey, she can do it. Here's a project. Or if it was more along the lines of, like, she did okay with that. Like, maybe she could help some more. I'm not really sure what went through his head. But for me, I was torn between this, like, okay, I'll help. And then what ultimately became this little dichotomy in my brain of, like, being a little irritated because this was supposed to be his project. He wanted the bees to this fascination with them. And I had probably about a month or six to eight weeks where I kind of was like, ah, I don't know if I like this because this was going to be his project and it's having a problem to fighting with myself internally on that sense of like ownership. And, but, you know, I picked him up and I brought him here and I, they're like this far basically because of me. And like, if I just get smarter about them, I think I can like keep helping them. And 
I don't know if he's got time for that and I want them to be successful. And so ultimately that was what overtook. But my brain had this little experience back and forth between like, yes, yes, no, no, yes, yes, no, no. <laughs> I don't know. Charles, I, I was, was that really, your ultimate plan? I was just really thinking like <laughs> it would be good for you, honestly, to have something that you had ownership for. Like that was truly yours. And I like you started to get really kind of interested when you were timid. I was happy to help you. But as soon as you started getting more confident with it, I was just like, you know, I'm back off and let her do it. Like, so it'd be great. Two questions. Uh, Beth, are you still um, are, are you are you continuing on with with taking care of bees? Is this is this a thing that we can see in season two? Yeah, I have a honey extractor now. I oh, took you out. Should you should see all the equipment that she has. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, second, second question for Charles. Um, this is a behind the scenes relationship question. Like when when Beth learns something new or like changes a behavior or something, do you do you turn to her and give her the compliment? That's an incredible character arc, honey. <laughs> retrospectively i did i'm like i'm very i i gotta tell you i was i don't know if you know this about my dad but i was always raised to be pushed like by like you know withholding the compliment until the end to the last episode instead of giving it in the first and that was always kind of a driving force for me but no, I mean, like, I was incredibly proud of her. And, like, it was actually really amusing to me to see how into it she got. She would be, like, reading these books, like, while we were watching TV in the middle of the night. And I would just sit there and kind of smile and be like, I remember when you were, like, scared of these things. And now you're telling me all about the propolis and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> it was pretty crazy to see. It was a lot of fun. I last last thing because we gotta we gotta wrap it up here for this ep these episodes, but um, I'm really curious because the last element was bringing the animals home, but it was also the element that we really got to see a big factor of this series, and that's the kids. From the moment there were a couple of moments, and, and you know I say this as a father, but like just independent of that, like. When they were finger printing and Silas like slips and like goes and does a header into the paint on the thing and comes up just completely covered in paint to where Abigail, I ask Abigail, like, you know, I do the whole old McDonald had a, and then she says pig. And, you know, I, I just carry it into like, well, maybe next season, honey. Um, what, a like working with the kids and having them as a part of the show. I mean, obviously we wanted them as a farm. It was a big driver for us for the whole reason of doing this was partly for our kids or a big part of it was for our kids and, and having them exposed to this. But for you, you guys and watching them kind of grow up literally, like what was that like? And what were those moments like that you, you got the, the film? Oh, such a highlight. Take it away, Emily. Oh my goodness. Your kids are so wonderful. I I mean, I could have spent all day with them, Frank. Like, you know, I, I would have filmed every scene with Abigail and Silas. Um, but no, I mean they they were honestly one of the, the moment that you didn't bring up from the end of six that I just love is when you teach Abigail how to hold a sheep. Oh, yeah. I remember yep. really vividly in that moment thinking, this is the show. This is, we're watching you as a family pass down something that you learned as a kid. And here's the hands-on experience that you are, that, you know, you, you sort of like we speak to. But in that moment, I was like, this is it. This is what. This is what we've been talking about. And the amazing thing about Abigail, I mean, Silas was, he's now old enough, he could probably be doing this too. But in this moment, he was still very, very little. But the amazing thing in that moment for me about Abigail is you look on her face, she like sort of shrinks away, like, oh, this sheep made a sound, but then she pets the sheep anyway. And it was like, it's this beautiful moment of watching as she is, taking in something new, afraid, not afraid of it, but, well, maybe she is, but she's just figuring it out. And she just like reaches out 
to, to pet the sheep. And I thought this is, you know, this is the moment we, I mean, you can't, and then that's why I love, that's why I love unscripted because you can't come up with that. Like that's such a beautiful moment of her growing up um, in the, in the way, in a, in a space that you created so she could have that moment. Yeah, I think as a parent, it's hard sometimes to give your kids those opportunities and um, to be able to put them in an environment where they can be successful. Sometimes you are, especially with animals, you might have animals that aren't friendly towards kids. You might have an environment that's not conducive to allowing that child to feel safe to open up. And so I think it was for us a very special moment to, to be able to offer her this opportunity in an environment where she felt safe and comfortable and could really grow and learn. And, you know, everybody's personality is different. And hers is one where she's a little bit more cautious. So she needs that more than perhaps the Silas's of the world who just charge at something and don't stop to think about, gee, maybe it'll come right back at me, you know. And uh, it's just, it's it's a, a really great thing to be able to offer the kids. And I think, too, for the viewers of the show, not all kids have the opportunity to interact with animals like that. But for a child who is reserved to watch another child who is obviously a little bit uncertain, be able to interact successfully with an animal hopefully will give them confidence, too. And they can think about that moment when their opportunity in life presents. Well, that's a that's a strong way to end this episode. That that's a that's a really powerful thought about that I hadn't even occurred to me about like what what the value and uh, and all the work that we put into it how how it could benefit other children as well. So that's that's fantastic. Well, I want to say thank you to our special guests. We will be having them back, John and Emily, executive producers of the incredible Pole Farm, and um. I want to tell the audience, like, I hope you guys really liked episode five and six. Tune in to all new episodes of The Incredible Pole Farm on Natchea Wild on Saturdays at 10 p.m., followed by Sundays. You can stream it on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Until next week, we'll look forward to seeing each other again. Thanks, everyone.